Today we're talking about sinks. Who knew there would be so many considerations when trying to purchase a sink? Whether it's replacing the sink in your current kitchen or you're doing a renovation or a new construction, getting the sink right is very important. The content of this video is a mixture of old and new content sewn together, so hopefully it's coherent, but the information in this video should answer tons of questions that you have about what kind of sink you should buy for your kitchen. Also, I'll be answering questions from my viewers on comments that they've had on previous videos about kitchen sinks. Alex Prow, what kind of sink do you prefer or have? Well, Alex, thanks for the question. I have an Arctica Hampton 31 inch top mount sink because I have laminate. I think it's a 16 gauge. It is a single bowl stainless steel center drain. I absolutely love it. I don't know if Arctica is a good brand or not, to be honest with you. The price was right. It was under $300. I have no issue with it. I like it. I like stainless. It was a good choice for us so far after three years. It's held up very well. And so, yeah, it's an Arctica Hampton 31 inch which is a great size, by the way, for a single large bowl. Do you want the right sink for your kitchen? With so many options on the market and so many preferred uses, it's really hard to pin down what the perfect sink choice is for me and my kitchen. I'm gonna tell you what the perfect choice is and we can battle it out in the comments later. Just remember to keep it light. Here are the most common sink options available and why you should or shouldn't choose one. Starting off with the small single. A small single is meant to fit in a sink base of 24 inches to 30 inches. Of course, you can fit it in any size sink base, really. And the only real reason I can figure of why you would actually want to have a small single sink is just because you don't have room for anything else. So if you have a smaller kitchen or you're trying to replace a sink in a sink base that's already smaller, you might not have an option for a larger sink. And so therefore you have to go with a small single sink. Really, there's nothing wrong with a small single sink other than they're just smaller. They're still quite functional and they leave you with more counter space around the sink area. The other reason is you just like the look of a small single sink and that's just the look you're going for and you don't really have the need in your kitchen for a great big ginormous sink. In my experience with sinks, having an attached drain board on a small single would come in really handy. Try to get the largest single that you can fit in the base cabinet that you have. So if you have a 30 inch base cabinet, try to max that out and go with a 27 inch single sink. And I'm not talking about the small little prep sinks that go in an island or maybe in a butler pantry. I'm just meaning about your main kitchen sink. The standard double. These are double sinks obviously meant to fit in a cabinet anywhere from really 33 inches and up. And in my personal opinion, the least functional kitchen sink on the market. What? Are not two bowls better than one? You'd kind of think, and in some circumstances, yes, having a double sink is a real convenience, especially if you enjoy washing your dishes by hand and you need to have one bowl filled with water and one bowl for rinsing or drying or for whatever. They also come in very handy if you want to have a disposal system attached to your sink so that you have one bowl that's empty with the disposal underneath and one bowl that you can fill up and use and have filled with water. The reason I say they're not as functional is because each bowl is normally smaller than even a one single bowl for a single sink. So you have two smaller bowls that really they're not that great. You can't fit anything big in there. You can't hand wash anything large. And in the age of dishwashers, many people really don't need that double sink. Now my parents' generation grew up and are very used to having one side of their sink filled with water while the other side is empty and used for other purposes. But in my generation and others, we don't tend to do that so much. When we had a double sink, we'd never fill it with water and just let it go cold and get gross. To me, it's just disgusting, but that's just what I see people doing. However, if that's what you do, then it's a perfect choice for your kitchen. Now, you can get doubles that are sink and a halves so that you do have one larger bowl and one smaller bowl. I remember having a sink and a half one time. It had a great big large single bowl, which was pretty useful, and this tiny little bowl on the side, which I don't know what it was for. You could rinse a vegetable in it, but you can rinse a vegetable in any sink. You don't need to have it like minuscule. It all comes down to how you use your kitchen and what you prefer, and maybe even sometimes just what you're used to. If you're used to a double sink, you like how it functions and you're looking for a new sink, then maybe go ahead and just get another double sink. When I had a double sink, it just wasn't that great. It was a really nice sink. It was granite, it was beautiful, but it was like two small bowls, not really what we wanted. When we switch to the next sink I'm gonna talk about, it was much more beneficial for us 
So get the sink that really works for your lifestyle. Natalie Jones says, another best of both worlds option is a deep double sink. My parents installed one and it's awesome for hand washing folks who cook with large dishes. That's what I would like in my kitchen one day. Thanks for the helpful tips. Thank you, Natalie, for the comment. And I think what Natalie is talking about is the deep double bowl sink has a low center divider so that so that there's so there's room for pot handles within the sink itself. Some double sinks, the divider, the center to divide the two bowls comes all the way up to the top. And so you have these two basically strict double bowls that can't be used for anything else. And with a lower divider, uh, this takes care of that situation. So good tip from Natalie. Think about this next option, which is a large single. The large single, as big as a double sink, fits the same size cabinet, but with one bowl. The most functional type of kitchen sink, in my opinion, that is on the market. Here's why. Washing pots and pans and roasters and cutting boards and large dishes and anything oversized in one large single bowl is so convenient. Now this is not the sink for you if you like to hand wash your dishes or are used to filling up your sink with water. If that's the case, you're probably not gonna want a large single because one, that's a huge amount of water to try to fill up and two, that's it. Your sink is just, that's, that's all you can do, just water. You, you can't do anything else. All the other functions that you are so used to doing, you can't do because the sink's filled with water. If you have a dishwasher or you're just not a hand washer, you don't care about filling up a sink, you're just gonna rinse your dishes or you like to scrub big things and have the convenience of not having them tilted all every different way, then this is the sink that you might wanna consider. Now I've had every kind of sink out there just about. I've had a single, I've had a sink and a half, I've had a double, I now have a large single and I have to say that the large single for us in particular has been the most useful, the most functional and the sink we enjoy the most if you can enjoy sinks. Beth is asking, what's the pros and cons to a center drain and offset drain in a farmhouse apron sink? When you're shopping for a large single, try to find the drain hole that's in the back left or right. Especially if you're right-handed, go for the drain hole on the right hand side. Because if you attach some kind of disposal system to that drain and you're scraping off dishes, it's much more convenient that you're scraping them off onto the right hand side. And if you're using your large single with an attachment like that, it makes it a little easier. Normally these sinks are tapered on the bottom so that water flows towards the drain. Plus when you put a roaster or a large dish in the bottom of that sink, it's not covering the drain. Most of these sinks now come with, or you can buy as a separate attachment, a grid for the bottom and it allows things to dry in that sink in the event that you wanna put something in there, it drips dry right in the sink. Now let's talk about, okay, before we talk about anything else, I just first wanna say thank you for those of you who voted on this little poll that I put out the other day, asking you what you would prefer, a standard double sink or a large single sink. To my surprise, 71% of you voted on the large single, which I thought was interesting because I do get a lot of comments about how much more functional a double sink is compared to a large single. So thank you very much if you voted. Getting that input from you is really helpful. Now one commenter did mention that they have what's called a low divide sink, and it's basically a sink that has a shallow depth divider between the two bowls. It's a double sink, but because of the shallow depth of the divider, you can put a large pot or a roaster in there and still wash it and you do whatever you need to do with it. And you still have the use of two shallower bowls for filling up water. I think this is a pretty good mix. A lot of companies are coming out with these options in recent years, just so that consumers can have the best of both worlds. If you don't want a full on double and you don't want a full on single, you can kind of have a little bit of both. So Melissa, thank you very much for commenting on that so I can bring this information to everyone else. This might be a really good option for you. Whether you're a professional chef or a home cook, a workstation sink can take your kitchen to the next level. From increased functionality to improved safety and organization, I'll be diving into six key reasons why you should consider upgrading to a workstation sink. Increased workspace. One of the advantages of a workstation sink is that they come with a variety of options to increase the functionality of that space. These sinks are ideal for any size kitchen, large or small. They're even a great choice for RVs and tiny homes. Especially if you are low on counter space, the workstation sink doubles as a work and prep area so that you can do some of those tasks right on top of the sink when you're not using it for other sink purposes. You can add a cutting board accessory, you can have a colander, you can have a drying rack. So there's many accessories that can go with the workstation sink so that when you're low on counter space, the sink can help you in that department. Everyone wants a sanitary kitchen and the workstation sink will help you with that. You 
can wash dishes, defrost meat, prep vegetables, all at the same time in the same sink. And when you have guests over or you just don't wanna deal with the dishes right now, you can cover the whole thing up by putting on a lid and just forgetting about it for now. I'm assuming that the dishes don't overflow the sink like mine would in my house. It's a lifesaver for those who are just chronically short on time and just don't want to deal with the dishes right now. Workstation sinks also help with kitchen functionality and storage because you don't need to store colanders and cutting boards and all these things elsewhere or on your countertop because they're integrated into the function of the sink. Plus these accessories can stay mounted in the sink so that you don't have to worry about storing them somewhere also increasing the overall functionality and use of your kitchen for other things. You can chop vegetables, clean dishes, do all this stuff in one convenient location, prep a whole meal right on a workstation sink, and that keeps the countertops and everything around that clean and sanitary and can be used for other purposes. And normally all the accessories are dishwasher safe and easy to clean so that you don't have to worry about those becoming a hazardous place for microbes to grow on. Workstation sinks can also help your kitchen be a little safer. It can get kind of sketchy pouring the water through a colander in the sink and just things tipping over and spilling over. Having an integrated colander that's not going anywhere is very safe and makes it a little more easier. The cutting board that's integrated is very firm and in place. I don't know about you, but some of the cutting boards I've gotten in the past are just these plastic things that kind of slide around. They're not very safe, so you have to be very careful cutting on them because they can like slip out and you don't know what could happen. And if you have a garburator attached, you can just put everything into that right from the sink without carrying stuff around. So overall, it's a little safer to use and that can be a really good benefit. One of the really good benefits of a workstation sink is just the amount of options that are available out there. From what I've seen, you can get very small to very large workstation sinks with a variety of different integrated accessories that you can use to make life easier in the kitchen. And one of the drawbacks to a workstation sink overall is while, yes, the smaller versions can be less expensive generally you're getting into a quite expensive sink but that's subjective price is relative if you want to pay five six thousand dollars for a sink that's up to you and there's all kinds of variety in price depending on what you want and of course the quality maybe you don't want to deal with all the accessories maybe you just want a regular sink and you don't mind all that other stuff then that's perfectly fine because I don't have one and I get away with all kinds of stuff I've heard a lot of good reports from clients that I've had who have purchased them they absolutely love them and so it's definitely worth checking up. Absolutely agree with everything you say. Thank you. I actually don't agree with everything I say half the time, so that's really cool. I would get a single sink and use a plastic tub that fits in the sink if needed to fill with water and soak dishes. Your comments about the corner sink made me laugh. Very keen to find out what material you recommend. What? First of all, what's he talking about with the corner sink? Oh my gosh, Oh no. The corner is, in my opinion, not the best place to put a sink. I just don't like it. Now, I have a few caveats to that. If you put the corner cabinet on a 45 degree angle, or the cabinet itself is made with a 45 degree front and you can put any type of sink in there possible, then this is fine. Now the only benefit with a corner sink is that it's not as congestive in the walkthrough space. So that's like one of the pluses. But the negatives are around whether or not you have laminate countertop or not, and having water around that seam is never a good idea. And in a corner cabinet, it seems that water splashes onto the cabinet and onto the floor easier just because of the shape of the front of that unit. Okay, I realize I'm a little bit hard on the corner sink idea. Just to be fair, I'll show you a few of these really cool corner sink ideas that I came across. Even though it's not my favorite location and I'm not a fan of the 90 degree corner sink, there's still some really great options out there if you're forced into that location or you just like it. For some people, the corner is the only place that that sink can go. And if that's the case, then you wanna make that space as functional as possible and you want it to look nice as well. So of course, take everything I say with a grain of salt. If you have a corner sink and you love it, go you. I just don't love it. Right, okay, so there you have it. Kiki says, my friend has a corner sink. It's so awkward to wash dishes there. Not a super fan of corner sinks, obviously. I don't like corner cabinets at all, so throwing a sink into the situation just makes it all the more worse, but uh, good comment from Kiki. It is very awkward to wash dishes in a corner sink. Pam Cat is weighing in on a corner sink situation as well, saying that even worse when dishwasher is involved, I had a small kitchen with a U-shape Sink at the end of the U with a dishwasher to the right angle on one side, very inconvenient. Yeah, when you throw in a small sink and it's U-shaped and you throw a corner sink in there, 
the whole thing can get out of hand pretty quickly. Thanks, Pam, for that comment. Now, I know there's some of you out there that probably have these, and I am sorry for you, but I'm only basically teasing as well, so don't take it offensively. However, there are two reasons why I'm not a fan of these as a designer. One has to do with the countertop choice that you have, so if you have laminate countertop, having a 90 degree corner sink is a really bad idea because that laminate is gonna get destroyed. It doesn't matter who installed that countertop, doesn't matter how good they were, it doesn't matter what glue they used, I don't care if they welded it together, water is gonna get in that seam and water is gonna destroy that countertop. And the number two reason, because of the shape of the corner base, water tends to really splash everywhere on the floor, on the cabinet, and on you because of that 90 degree corner and the faucet swings between both, and in between those two bowls is just basically this flat area that's just gonna, water's gonna splash everywhere. And yes, you can just turn the faucet on in one and go to the other side, but if you've had one of these sinks, you know, you got the water on, you turn the faucet to the other side, and water's just <laughs> going everywhere. I get asked this question quite a bit. I've never owned a copper sink. In fact, I've never even sold one. It was just not something that was very popular in my area. However, I've found eight considerations that you should think about if you're planning to purchase a copper sink. Durability. Copper is a very durable and it's a long lasting material. It's easily able to handle the wear and tear of extensive use in a kitchen situation. Copper is known to have antimicrobial properties, which means it's able to help prevent the growth of harmful microbes in the sink area. Patina. That's nice to say. The patina can change over time, meaning it changes from a shiny copper look to something that's more muted in the brown and green tones. Some people really desire this and love this about copper. You should consider the maintenance of a copper sink because they do need to be polished in order to prevent tarnishing. However, I don't think this is a huge deal. It doesn't need to be done every single day, but check with the manufacturer of the particular copper sink you're interested in to see how much maintenance is involved in the one you're looking at. Style. There's a variety of styles, just like every other material that sinks are made of. Copper is no different. You can get farmhouse sinks, undermount sinks, double, single. The sky's the limit. There's lots of options out there if you're looking for a copper sink. Cost. Copper is a little more expensive than other materials. However, it is also considered a lifetime investment. So you gotta weigh it out. Environmentally friendly. Most people don't consider the environment when they're buying a sink, when they're in the store. However, it is something to consider. Copper is from the earth, it's a natural element, and therefore it is completely 100% recyclable forever, which is a good thing. If you wanna pay the extra price, you can get a copper sink customized. You can get other sinks customized too, but you can also get copper sinks customized, meaning variety of shapes and sizes and whatnot. So sky's the limit in terms of that. Of course, you're gonna have to pay for that but it's pretty cool. What sink should you buy? With so many materials out there, how do I know which one is the best? Let's look at the different materials. Hopefully it'll help you make a decision when you're purchasing your next sink. For most of my life, stainless steel has been the standard sink material that's been on the market. Stainless steel is very durable, sanitary, easy to clean, and relatively inexpensive. It comes in a variety of gauges, which means its thickness, so anywhere normally from 16 gauge to 23-ish gauge, 23 being thin and 16 being thicker. Commercial sinks can sometimes be 14 gauge. For the average consumer like me or you, normally we're gonna be looking at sinks that are like 16 to 18 gauge. There's a couple issues with stainless steel. One, it's pretty noisy. So things are clanging and banging around in there. And two is that it doesn't hold heat that well. Metal is a conductor, it helps just dissipate heat. For me, that's not a big deal. I don't fill up my sink with water because I have a large single. I don't hand wash dishes that way. The generation before me would really find this beneficial because they're used to filling up that sink with water and letting it sit there. So the longer that water sits there, the longer it can stay hot or warm, the better. Now they clang and bang. I mean, it's a sink. I guess it's supposed to clang and bang. And for the last number of years, they've been adding these rubber pads on the bottom of the sink, and that's to help with the noise of that sink. So when you're putting things in there, it's a little bit of absorption. I don't know if it makes a difference. Stainless is a great choice if you just want a run of the mill, really durable, gonna be there for a long time sink that you can use. Stainless is a great option. All right, I'm interrupting my own video because I realize there's a few things I still wanna say about stainless steel. I wanna bring you some more of the benefits to stainless steel and not leave you hanging on that aspect. Number one is that it's corrosion resistant, meaning that it resists corrosion. They use chromium when they're making stainless steel and this component is the key ingredient to making stainless steel what it is today. Another benefit which may not be a big deal because you're using stainless as a sink is that it's fire and heat resistant and you don't have to worry about 
any type of thermal shock, which you can get with other materials. Now, one of the best features of stainless steel as far as using it in a sink is concerned, it is extremely hygienic. Because it is non-porous, it's easy to clean, it's easy to maintain, and of course they make it with under mount, top mount, apron sink, you name it, you can get it in stainless. Anywhere from $300 to $600 is gonna get you a pretty good stainless steel sink. And that depends on the gauge and the brand and how much they're actually marking that sink up. Composite sinks are another great option. They're made of granite or quartz aggregate and they're mixed with resin. Normally about 80% of some kind of powdered granite and 20% of some type of resin to help you mold that sink and shape it into a sink. These sinks are great and they've been marketed against stainless steel as being able to hold the heat of water and not as loud. Again, not a big deal if you don't hand wash your dishes in a bowl filled with water. Having a sink hold heat is here nor there. But if it's a thing that you do and that's how you use your kitchen, then this may be a good option because that bowl will hold water hotter longer. The thing that is an actual real concern that you should really watch for is the knockouts for the faucets. Usually when you buy a granite or quartz or a stone sink, it comes with one hole already knocked out for you. But if you look underneath that sink, especially if it's a top mount sink, because an under mount, this wouldn't matter. But for a top mount sink, one hole is already cut out for you, and the rest underneath, you've got a bunch of options, probably four or five other holes that you could knock out. I've seen this go horribly wrong, and I wouldn't want that to happen to you. So if you're doing that, be very cautious to follow the instructions precisely, because this is what will happen, is you will pop that hole out, and a big chunk of your sink will just go blam. It's so nerve-wracking to take your $400 brand new granite sink, pop a screwdriver through one of those knockouts, not knowing what's gonna happen. These sinks are very durable. They're meant to be used by you, the consumer, and normally you're not gonna have any issue with these types of sinks. Like anything, there's extremities, and extreme case uses where you drop something majorly heavy in there, and that whole sink just goes shatter and you know that's not good they're also quite a bit heavier than a stainless steel sink and normally it is recommended that they are supported especially if you're using an undermount sink the manufacturer will give you instructions on how to do that don't skip that part it is very important make sure that thing is secured you won't regret it and on average you're looking at a range of four to eight hundred dollars the great thing about these sinks is that you can get different colors and that's a really nice feature. So if you want a white or a blue or a gray or a black, you can get that. If you're my age and you were born in the 70s, most likely you're familiar with a porcelain enamel sink. So this is a cast iron sink that has porcelain enamel. Maybe your parents or your grandparents had one of these sinks. They were nearly indestructible, so easy to clean, really nice high gloss finish, and heavy as now, unbeknownst to me, cast iron sinks are very popular. More and more retailers are carrying more and more varieties of cast iron sinks. And one of the main benefits of cast iron sink is just their durability. They're going to last a long time. The only downfall is that it is fairly brittle. That if you did bang that and chip off a piece of that porcelain enamel, it's gonna be an issue. So, take that into consideration. One viewer commented specifically about their porcelain enameled sink, and they said, we currently have an almond colored porcelain enameled sink, which is chipped and very hard to keep clean. Anything metal leaves marks, so I'm constantly scrubbing to get that out. Thank you for that comment, because it helps everyone else figure out, is this a sink choice that I should go with? Should I go with porcelain enamel, or should I look for something else? What they're doing now are what's called fire clay sinks. Fire clay sinks are meant to mimic this old style porcelain enameled sink, except that they're made of clay and not cast iron. They're still porcelain enamel. They still have that really nice high gloss porcelain finish. Most often you'll see a fire clay in the shape of a farmhouse apron front sink. So I know right off the bat that probably half of you just aren't gonna like these because they're farmhouse sinks. They're made by molding clay at very, very high temperatures and then they enamel it and again, they bake that thing to up to 2000 degrees. bam -o, you get this really, really durable sink. They come in limited colors, but again, you can get them in colors. These sinks are even heavier than the other ones I've mentioned 
and they definitely need to be mounted properly. Because a lot of these sinks are apron front sinks or a farmhouse, they sit on a platform, which is very beneficial. But if you don't have a platform for that thing to sit on, you definitely have to brace it because it will be heavy and adding anything to it is only gonna make it heavier and you don't want that sink to fall out or anything to happen to it. Five to $800 is gonna get you your standard fire clay sink. I'll link to all these sinks in the description below. You can check them out if you wish. They are affiliate links and I do get a commission if you choose to purchase one from there, but you can get these sinks anywhere they sell sinks. Now there's also sinks out there that are material match, such as Corian or Staron, which is an acrylic solid surface and they can mold sinks of the same material right into that surface. There are no seams, which is a really great feature, especially if you don't like trying to clean all the grime and gunk, either from your undermount rim or from your top mount, this is a great way to go. But of course, you have to be also purchasing the countertop surface along with it. These integrated sinks are very similar to their cousins, the granite composite sinks, and that they're made also with resins and with mineral dust. However, the amount of resin used in making these acrylic sinks is much higher than the amount of aggregate and minerals that's in the composition. One of the pros of this material is that it can be easily repaired because it is the resin that allows you to repair it. Another viewer who has a Corian sink commented this. Currently I have Corian integrated sink and counter. I like how easy it is to directly clean the counter into the sink without having a lip around the edge of the sink undermount. Nothing gets in the edge between the sink and the countertop. However, the white sink has discolored and stained after 25 years. A hard scrub with Comet gets most of the stains. Again, it's great to hear from people who have experience with these surfaces firsthand. I will say this, if you've had that sink for 25 years and it's still in great shape and you just need a little bit of Comet to clean that sink, I'd say you got a pretty good deal. So take this into consideration. If you're looking for a material that's gonna last a long time, maybe this is an option for you. And the price of these is gonna vary depending on the price of the countertop choice that you're going with. For the sink option, normally most retailers and most manufacturers will have the price per foot for their countertop, and if you want a sink, it's so much money. Normally, you're gonna pay three or $400 to have the sink added on, and that depends on the type of material, depends on the manufacturer, of course, that you're using, and depends on the size, and there's a few different factors. So to nail down a price for that, you actually have to go through the manufacturer to find that out. Another reason why I won't choose a Corian integrated sink is the possibility of blowout if you dump boiling water into the drain. And you cannot put pans directly from the stove into the sink. Talking about Corian, as an acrylic solid surface, great for a countertop. I have heard reports and I've had had customers in the past who were not particularly impressed with the sink quality, but then I've had others that had never had a problem. One of the issues I've seen in the past is the sink had spider cracking and it could have been just the drain assembly being tightened, just over tightened, causing that material to crack. I don't know for sure, but that's one of the issues that had happened. The biggest problem with kitchen sinks is that water spills out the front, onto your cabinet doors, onto your fronts, onto your floor, onto you. I'm gonna tell you why this is such a big deal and what you can do possibly to prevent that from happening. <laughs> This first one you're not gonna like. I hate to even mention it because I'm gonna get roasted for this. It's called a farmhouse sink. Farmhouse sinks or apron sinks are designed so that they have this big apron in the front and that apron helps when water spills over the front of that sink so that it doesn't go directly on the cabinet. And when it's not going on the cabinet and it's just on the front of that sink, it's easy to wipe off, it's easy to see, it's easy to get before it gets to anywhere else. Now yes, water can still splash on you and splash on the floor, and that's a different issue. But the farmhouse sink and one of its design features is just that, prevents water from spilling onto the cabinet below it. So having a sink that helps prevent water from getting on the cabinets below is a really great feature. The number one warranty claim from all my years as a kitchen designer has been doors that are damaged, on the sink cabinet. You go to the client's house and they say, I don't know what it is, but these doors are chipping and peeling and the paint finish won't stay on them. You look around their kitchen and all the other doors are fine. Really, it's just these doors here? Yes. Is it because there's water splashing on them and being left there and not getting dried up? No, I never do that. I always, always wipe up the water. <laughs> okay, but none of the other doors have a problem, just happens to be these ones? No. If you have a cabinet that's damaged by water, you're not gonna get 
the warranty claim for that cabinet. Of course, I just replaced it anyway because I'd rather just have a happy client than us just to be fighting about whether or not you did or didn't wipe up the water on your cabinet doors, which is obvious that you didn't. No matter what the material is that it's made from, having water sit there is never good. Mold can get in there. You don't want that to happen. One of the things you may consider but sometimes gets overlooked is to put a liner in the bottom of that sink base. Water under there, probably at some point. There's cleaners under there that could get spilled. So there's lots of opportunity for water to sit in there. It's closed, there's not a lot of airflow, so that can lead to mold and it can lead to the cabinet swelling or just being ruined. A lot of cabinet manufacturers come with some type of tray that you can put in, but you can find, and even at your local dollar store, these rollout mats that are meant to sit in the bottom of that cabinet to help prevent water from staying on there. At the very least, until you get in there to wipe it up. Water is very, very powerful. It will find its way anywhere and so the more you can do to protect your sink base the longer your cabinets are going to last for you and you're not going to have issues with that base particularly. You have a sink base that's starting to get moldy or the doors are starting to peel and they're not matching the rest of the doors anymore it can be a real nuisance. I mean you can even have rust issues if you have pullouts and other type of metals underneath there and you just want to prevent that as much as possible. Let's identify some of the pain points and some of the problems that we have with sink cabinets. Plumbing is a big issue. There's a lot of pipes inside that cabinet that can really get in the way of it being usable. Depending on the type of sink you have, depending on how many drains you have, and depending on how many faucets you have, whether you have a hot water faucet and things like that, will determine how much space is going to be used up by plumbing. And then of course you have dishwasher tie-ins and maybe other things that incorporate into the sink drain and the sink water supply lines. Not only do they take up space, but they're points of breakage or possible problems for water leaks down the road. Clutter is a huge deal underneath the sink. Rat poison underneath there, along with vinegar, along with scrubby brushes, and maybe dog food, and, and who knows? Where did all this stuff come from? I hardly ever use it because there's stuff way in the back in there, and it's hard to access, and it's kind of grimy, and frustrating. Most sink cabinets are not accessible. There's no thought put into making this cabinet not something that you have to get on your hands and knees to crawl in under. Now there's a couple reasons for this. One, you have to get in there to install your sink and install your plumbing. So the more installations of things in that cabinet, the harder it's going to be for you or a plumber or whomever to get into that cabinet to fix something if you have to. However, having some kind of mechanism in there would be very beneficial to access the things in the back of that cabinet that are generally generally more difficult to access. And if you're like myself, you have your garbage underneath your sink. And so there's some kind of garbage pull-out mechanism, or maybe it's just a bin in that cabinet along with maybe a small compostable bin. That can get really grimy and really dirty. And another reason why the sink cabinet can tend to be just one of those areas that is Ugh. Plus you add in some UV filters or some other type of water filters or a garburator and before you know it the whole thing is just clogged up with stuff that's very useful and usable and you do appreciate it but it makes that cabinet much more difficult to access. And then of course there's the size of the sink cabinet itself. We want to have a sink cabinet that's big enough to obviously fit the sink but not too big that it takes up more room than necessary taking away from space for other usable cabinets like drawer banks or whatever. So because the sink cabinet is not the most accessible, the most functional cabinet, it tends to get the least amount of attention. So maybe the sink cabinet will never be the pride of the kitchen, but it doesn't have to be like the rear end of the kitchen either. It can be much more usable and there's a few ways I think that we can do this. And going back to the size of the sink cabinet, I don't think there's anything wrong with making it maybe just a little bit bigger. Just give ourselves a little bit more room for what we're going to add to that cabinet to make it more functional. I think the first thing we should consider adding to our our sink cabinet is a liner for the bottom. This will save a ton of headaches down the road in the event that something spills or there's a leak from the plumbing underneath the sink. Having a liner underneath that you can pull out and clean off and get the water out of there is a really good idea that seldom gets thought about when you are purchasing a kitchen. You should always request that, especially if you're ordering a kitchen from wherever it's being custom made or even if it's something off the shelf, even if you're buying a ready to assemble unit like Ikea, so that in the future when a spill happens or a leak happens, you don't ruin the bottom of that cabinet or create an environment for mold to grow. They're quite easy to install. I'll add a link to one in the description below. If you want to purchase one and put it in your existing sink cabinet, I highly recommend that you do that. Now, the biggest thing you can consider under your sink cabinet is to allow yourself some functional functionality by adding some kind of pull-out mechanism or some kind of door attached mechanism that you can help yourself by storing things that everything's not all cluttered, that everything has a space. What that does is not only make it easier to access, but it kind of allows 
allows you to inventory what's in that cabinet so that there's stuff not just piled in the back that gets forgotten about. It's actually easy to get at when it needs to be replaced or something that can be stored in the back there can easily be stored by pulling out the whole unit. Now this is going to differ for everybody because all of us have a different sink cabinet configuration and the plumbing and all the stuff that we talked about earlier can be in the way and this can cause problems. There's a variety of different options out there and at least I would recommend that you go out measure the space that is available under your sink cabinet and go and find something whether it's in a hardware store or online somewhere that you can go and install with ease. If you're a homeowner and you're not renovating your kitchen but you want to just make this space better is just to address some of these simple issues and overall that makes your kitchen more enjoyable to work in. If you have some kind of great idea as you're watching this video they're like oh he didn't mention this put it in the comments let everybody know so that we can all benefit from your knowledge as well as mine so we can have the best sink cabinets possible. What about flip down trays? I'm not a fan of the flip down tray that can be installed. Normally this would be installed in a new kitchen. It's not something generally you'd retrofit, but it can be. It's the false front on your sink cabinet if you have one that can flip down and there's trays inside, whether plastic or metal, whether two or one you know, big long one. On just the functionality side, it does add that little bit of extra storage for things that maybe don't have a home, a scrub brush or you know a scrubbing pad, something like that. But just be aware that there are some certain problems with them being that they don't dry out properly and kind of get grimy. If not done right, you can just introduce water to the inside of your cabinet that way. Installing drawers instead of just two big doors and an open space is a great way to do a sink cabinet, but it has to be really pre-planned out because of the plumbing. Now, the only problem with this that I have is that generally the front, the whole door tends to pull out and you have to get access from the sides when you do that. And this can also maybe be a little bit of a hassle if you have to get in that cabinet. But overall, I think having a drawer underneath that space is a really good idea, makes it even easier to access the stuff because you don't have to open a door and pull out some kind of tray. Lots of ways to do this, whether the drawer is customized to fit around the plumbing or whether the plumbing is into the back wall instead of through the floor and you have the floor space in the cabinet. But it's something to look at and to consider, even if if you are not renovating your kitchen, you can go right now, look in that space and say, is there a way that we could retrofit and install a drawer instead of having the two doors? Pull out garbage bins, definitely something that I recommend under the sink, but with some caution, they do get grimy. Make sure that it's a pull out one, not one that you have to get in and get at. You might be dealing with all kinds of plumbing and all kinds of issues, so you have to deal with what you have, but there's always ways that you can look at that to make that a little bit better, even if you have to redo the plumbing. Now that's a big one, and obviously you're probably not gonna do that yourself unless you're very handy and you're okay with doing that kind of work, but I don't recommend it. I'm not saying you should. You should definitely hire somebody. It might be something you could consider if underneath the plumbing's kind of just a mess. There can be ways to tighten that up to make it so that it's more functional for you to use. And then of course, the kind of current trend is not to have doors at all, but to have these curtains that go on the sink base. It seems to be something that I see in a lot of different pictures from designers. It certainly saves you the hassle of of having to replace cabinet doors, so maybe it's a plus for that reason. And it's also maybe beneficial because it probably will allow more airflow in that cabinet in the event that water gets in the base. Ross McLeod, no cabinet below the sink is the go. Curtains, get some textural relief from all those hard surfaces. Fabric absorbs and disperses, pick some crazy prints and make sure they are washable. The under sink void can breathe too. Just saying. Of course, Brent is chiming in saying, hard pass for me on the curtain in place of doors below the sink. And he's laughing about it. Um, yeah, I mean, this is one of those trends, one of those things that people are either like, that, that looks ridiculous or they absolutely love it. And to each his own, so you can decide. Best way to do a sink cabinet, according to me, little larger sink cabinet than standard. So if it's 36 is what it calls for, go with a 39. I'm a fan of a large single. I don't like doubles, I don't like small singles, all that stuff. So if you're dead against having a single bowl sink and you want a double, then I, I have a, an, another way we could probably do this. Large single bowl sink, which has one drain, and that drain should be offset. Right to the left, it really doesn't matter. The plumbing is also offset by default. And if the plumbing is offset and you plan for that with the rough ends of the plumbing, 
you can create for yourself a ton of space on the base of that cabinet that is very usable. So lots of space for pullouts, lots of space for garbage pullouts, lots of space for just adding things into that sink cabinet that are gonna make your life easier. And when done correctly and when pre-planned, can create the absolute best sink cabinet scenario that I can think of. Now, if you have a double sink or you just love double sinks and you wanna go that route, instead of plumbing it in the center where the drains go out like this, have it offset as well. So you have your main drain and then you have the plumbing from the other sink bowl coming down to that. So essentially it's doing the same type of thing as the single bowl and you're creating more space. You might just not have as much vertical height. Jason says if you have a stainless steel sink and it's loud enough to bother you, find some Dynamat. It's a peel and stick sound dampening material typically used in car audio. There are others as well, but this was one I could recommend offhand. One of the issues with a stainless steel sink is that they're clangy and bangy and loud. A lot of them do have sound dampening built into them with rubber mats already mounted. If yours doesn't, it might be something that you should think about. This is a very good tip from Jason to help lessen the noise of a stainless steel sink. Great comment, thank you, Jason. The secret to the proper sink location depends, of course, on a few factors, one being your plumbing and whether or not you can move that plumbing or you can't. So right out of the gate, for some of you, the proper sink location is just gonna depend on that one factor. You can't move your plumbing and it's in this one location, so that's where the sink has to go. Because of that, you need to make the most out of that location as possible. Whether it's in front of a window or in an island or on a run or out in the backyard. So you got pipe sticking out the wall, slap a sink base in there, put a sink in it, Bob's your uncle, call it a, wash your dishes, it's all good. But if you can move your plumbing or you're building a new home, then the sky's the limit as far as where you can put the sink. So let's talk about some of the best locations and the pros and cons to each one of those coming in at the most popular place that most people put their sink. And I get called boring for this, but it's just a fact that most people put their sink under their window. Oh, well, that's too boring, but not really. It's kind of not boring, actually, when you get to look out your window and look at beautiful nature. It's less than boring. But anyway, that location is really, really popular and one that is a go-to, especially in many North American homes. I don't know where this trend started or why putting the sink under a window became a thing. Actually, I do know why. Years ago, before there was any modern plumbing, we would have our sink under the window so that we could easily empty the basins out the open window. It was the most convenient place because you didn't have to carry that basin of water across your room, across your kitchen, to a door and toss the water outside. And over time, as sinks began to be plumbed within the home, that location under the window was so normal that we just kept on putting the sink cabinet there. I'm sure there's stories out there where someone was walking by the window in the olden days and so-and-so was in the kitchen and they just happened to toss out that old basin of grimy water right on whoever was walking by. Yeah. It creates a nice open feel around your head. It's nice and bright. You look out the window to whatever's happening outside. Lots of headroom, there's lots of visuals. It works, why fix it if it's not broken? You don't need to move that sink just for the sake of moving it. So if you're renovating your kitchen and you're like, I think I'd like to move my sink, make sure it's just not because you think you need to in order to be trendy. If the sink works, under your window, then that's where it works. Why change it? Another very popular choice is to put the sink in your island. Now this also gives you a very open feel because there's nothing surrounding your head. So it's very open as long as you don't mind looking out at the rest of your house. Or if you have guests and you don't mind looking at them, then this is a good idea. Now the only time that I would say this isn't a great idea is if you don't have some kind of extended countertop on your island. The extended countertop and countertop all the way around provides one, a landing area, and two, just places for water to splash on because water is gonna splash on and around the sink cabinet and you and the floor and everywhere else. If you still like the idea of a raised lunch counter, that's also okay because you have some kind of splash guard to prevent water from getting beyond that and onto the floor and onto the back of the cabinet. Depending on how you use your sink, of course, this can be very beneficial and kind of nice because if you are a hand washer of dishes, and you're just there doing stuff in the sink while there's people around the island or out in another part of your house, if it's open concept, then you are still able to converse and be in community with those people in your kitchen, unless you're just like an introvert like me and you just prefer to go wash the dishes and leave everyone else do their thing and not talk to anybody. You can also put a sink on a run of cabinets. Sink is there and you're looking at either the wall 
or cabinets in front of you. And sometimes you can raise those cabinets up to give you some more headroom. Some people like to put a mirror there just to give the illusion that there's more space. There's lots of different variations and I would say this is pretty popular, especially in smaller units or units where you don't have a window to put your sink under. This is a modern look and there's ways to do it so that it doesn't feel so cramped. I think the big thing with sinks is that you just don't want it to feel claustrophobic. We sort of want it to have a little more open feel to it. So this would have the least amount of openness to it because of the cabinets in our face. Where should you not put a sink? The worst place that you can put a sink is either next to an appliance directly, so there's no landing space on one side, or with nothing on one side. So either directly up against a wall or on the end of a run so that it's just nothing on the end, it's just a little strip of countertop, the end of an island, or maybe just an, an end of an L shape that's open and there's no return wall on on that end. It's really beneficial to have landing spots, landing areas on either side of that sink just so you can put stuff down and move things around. Other thing I recommend not to do is if you cannot move your plumbing, don't forcefully plumb pipes through cabinets so that you can have your sink over here when your plumbing's over here. Keep the plumbing in the sink cabinet and only go outside of the sink cabinet like if you have to. Having pipes running through your cabinets will cause problems down the road in case something leaks or in the event of condensation. Then once you pick the perfect location for your sink, you have a few options on the type of sink cabinet to choose to put that sink into. One being just what's called a regular full height door sink base, and it is what it is. Full height door, drop a sink in, there's no shelf, away you go. Lots of room for plumbing, lots of room if you're gonna have a double sink, so there's more plumbing, or if you're gonna have a disposal system. The other option is to have a false front, that matches the rest of your drawer fronts and two doors. No real benefit to one or the other. I think a full height door just gives you a little bit better access to the sink and getting at things. Now the other option with that type of cabinet is to have a flip down tray. These have become popular in the last decade where you have the hinge system on that mounted front and it flips down and there's little plastic trays in there. You can put scrub brushes or sponges or whatever and you can use that as some extra storage. The other option is to put in some kind of drawer bank system. Now for this, you need to be very specific on where your plumbing is and you have to plan that out in advance to know how the cabinet is gonna open and close around the plumbing pipes. And underneath the sink cabinet sometimes can be just this mess of cleaning supplies and, and stuff that just gets kind of left behind because the plumbing creates an issue for accessories and things that are pulling out. So having the drawers negates all that, you just have automatically this really nice storage system where you can put all your supplies, pull them out when you need them and away you go. One more interesting feature you can do, and this is more of a design feature, more than a functionality feature, but you can bump out that sink cabinet, normally three inches, to give you some depth and variety in the look of your kitchen. This is something that's easy to do, but again, has to be planned for. Now you can do this with RTA cabinets, you can do it with custom cabinets, or you can have custom cabinets made already with a bump out in the cabinet, so you just put it in place and away you go. Of course, you can't use laminate countertop if you're gonna do that option. You have to go with a stone, some kind of solid surface, because it would have to be fabricated to fit that bump out. It looks really nice, it's an option. If you're trying to design a functional kitchen, don't do it without watching this video first. Some uncommon questions to consider when you're designing your next kitchen. I'd love to help you design your next kitchen. Check out my website, www.mtkd.ca, and see if my solution might be right for you.